In this video, we're going to be exploring how to use the Bolts 1 implementation of AlphaFold 3 on Neurosnap to predict the structure of a complex that contains both proteins as well as nucleotides. So if you aren't already aware, Neurosnap is an online platform where you can access a lot of different tools for research in molecular biology and bioinformatics. So this includes protein structure prediction, molecular docking, molecular dynamics, as well as a bunch of other stuff. I really encourage you all to go check it out in your free time. Uh, but for this video, we're just gonna focus on Bolts 1 and and AlphaFold 3. So additionally, another uh, bit of a useful information is that AlphaFold 3 was originally released by uh, Google's DeepMind. However, since then, there's been a lot of different open source alternatives that have came out. So the three that we have on Neurosnap are Bolts 1, Chai 1, and Protonix. And this is because all three models are quite powerful. They have their own strengths and advantages. And on top of that, they have benefits for uh, being able to use for commercial purposes as well as academic purposes. So for this video, we're just going to do bolts one and the protein that we're going to be folding uh, or I guess I should say the complex is actually going to be this complex over here so it has PDB ID 1R0A and it's HIV uh, 1 reverse transcriptase with some DNA now what we're going to do to enter these sequences is we're just going to head over and we'll actually just paste everything directly over here and I'm going to remove the nucleotides over here so we just have the protein components. I'm going to hit submit and then what we're going to do is we're going to go to DNA and we're going to go hit this as well and what we can do is we can just hit submit and now we have all four sequences. We have our DNA sequences and our protein sequences. Additionally, if you wanted to do RNA as well, you, you just have to press this button. It's very straightforward and you can repeat the process from there. Now, uh, additionally, Bolts is really cool because it allows you to fold um, small molecules as well. In this particular case, we're not going to be folding any small molecules just because it's not really necessary for this demonstration. But when we do a tutorial on Chai and Protonix afterwards, I think what we'll do is we'll explore using small molecules for them. Additionally, uh, Bolts has a feature where you can provide different uh, residue modifications. So if you know the CCD code for a post-translational modification or something else like a glycosylation, then this can be specified over here by specifying the sequence, uh, the sequence name, the residue position, as well as the CCD code for the, for the modification. For this example, we don't really need to do this, but if you want to get the sequence name, you know, you just copy this over here and then you'd enter it right over here. Next up is pocket restraints. These are also optional and we don't need to specify them, but if you want um, you know, a particular chain to interact with a particular position or something like that, then you can specify these as well. Uh, additionally, if you want to specify covalent restraints, so something like a covalent bond, then you can do this as well. This is more of an advanced setting because you need to specify the exact atoms um, as well as uh, the positions relative, uh, relative to one another. But uh, it is a very powerful feature for those of you who uh, might want to use these. Lastly, we have um, MSA mode and the, uh, the last couple advanced settings. So the MSA mode, um, similar to AlphaFold 2, these models depend on an input MSA to extract coevolutionary information to then predict the structure. Uh, generally speaking, the MMSeq's UniRF uh, environment is the best database to search against. Um, and this one over here is also pretty decent, includes less, uh, less metagenomic sequences, which in some cases can improve results. And then finally, we have single sequence mode. So if you don't want to use the MMSeq's 2 API, then you can use the single sequence mode instead. And this will run the model in single sequence mode, which uh, means it doesn't use an MSA. And this generally lowers accuracy, but on de novo protein, some people have found that this actually improves accuracy. So it's, it's certainly worth exploring depending on your use case. Additionally, we're going to have another mode coming out very, very soon where we're going to be generating MSAs using a completely different approach. So this could be much more accurate once we have that um, finally released and available. Additionally, uh, you know, this uh, is another similar um, option to AlphaFold 2. It's a number of recycling steps. So recycling steps similar to AlphaFold 2 is when the model essentially takes a result um, that it's predicted and after it feeds it back into the model, kind of like uh, recycling as the name entails, so that it can build upon that prediction and refine it over time. So if you increase the number of recycling steps, you're also increasing the amount of time required to actually predict the structure. However, you're also um, improving the accuracy of the resulting structure. And generally, this is a very good trade-off, especially for much larger and complicated complexes. 
Next up, we have the number of sampling steps. This is uh, another advanced setting. You can generally leave this as 200, but uh, adjusting this number can result in sampling different confirmations for a structure, as well as perhaps increasing the accuracy in some more tricky structures as well. The number of diffusion samples corresponds to the number of proteins um, you want to sample for that particular uh, input. Generally, five is sufficient, so you get five different results and you can compare them and see how consistent it is. And then next up, we have the step scale, which is for the temperature throughout the diffusion process. And you can generally leave this as is as well, and it shouldn't really impact the results too much. So now what we're going to do is we're just going to run the job. It shouldn't take too long, and once everything is ready, we'll be back with the results. We are now back with the results, and as we can see, this job took 10 minutes to complete. And now, just looking at the structure, we can already see some immediate similarities between the PDB structure we initially submitted and the structure that was predicted by AlphaFold 2 during this run. So in terms of different options for visualizing the molecule, we can, uh, color, the, uh, we can color the complex by spectrum, by secondary structure, as well as amino acid and some other options. Moreover, if you want to visualize the actual surface of the molecule, which can be very helpful uh, for situations like these, we can also visualize by molecular surface or van der Waals uh, surface, or what we can do is we can also do solvent accessible or solvent excluded surface. It really just depends on what you're trying to accomplish. And finally, we also have by element visualizations. So if you want to see the actual side chains as well as the backbones of these molecules, and you're, you're able to do that with the element option. So I'll just go back to chain. And uh, you know before we proceed, it's also important to note that you can actually download the different models that are predicted over here in the SIF format. And from there, you can load them into another tool like PyMolar, Chimera, as well as uh, you know other tools on Neurosnap or another platform for further downstream analysis. All the files are, are absolutely yours and you're free to do with them uh, as necessary. Next up, uh, you'll also notice that we have a change structure option. So if you want to change between the different SIF files that are outputted by this model, you can actually do that over here. These number of, uh, sorry, these models, um, these different models that are outputted by AlphaFold 3 are dependent on this parameter over here, the diffusion samples that we talked about earlier. So because we set that to five in the initial step when we submitted, uh, we have five different structures that were predicted by the model. Next up, we're going to be discussing the different metrics that are uh, predicted by this model. So for almost all these different metrics over here, the values are going to be ranging between zero and one, where values closer to one indicate more positive results or higher quality results. The only exceptions to this are the complex PD and complex IPD that do not follow this scale, and we'll talk a little bit more about them later on. The most important metrics that we want to talk about are the overall quality and aggregate score, which are uh, you know tied together and go hand in hand. A higher aggregate score indicates that the model overall is going to be very high quality. So we can see that model one, which uh, you know these models are ranked from best to worst, uh, was actually uh, found to be overall the most accurate. It has overall the best metrics. So this is why it has a higher aggregate score. The next best one is going to be two. And overall, the worst model that was predicted is going to be number five. The next metric we're going to be discussing is the complex PLDDT. Um, so if you remember PLDDT, or predicted local difference di uh, difference distance test from AlphaFold 2, it's essentially the same metric. And it's long story short, just a metric that tells you the per residue confidence in a residue's uh, spatial orientation and position. So higher values indicate that those residues are predicted with a higher degree of confidence uh, by AlphaFold 3. Complex IPLDT is the exact same thing, except for instead of averaging over the entire structure, it actually just averages over the interfaces. So this tells, this is better for interpreting whether or not, um, you know, a complex is actually likely and those protein-protein uh, or interface-interface interactions are actually happening. Next up, we have the PTM and uh, IPTM scores. So PTM is the predicted TM score. It's the same as AlphaFold 2, and higher values indicate a more high quality structure. IPTM is the same thing, except for it's calculated only for the interfaces. So overall higher IPTM means that you have an overall higher quality complex. Ligand IPTM is uh, more or less the same thing, but it only applies to like the small molecules. And because we didn't uh, supply any small molecules, you can see that this value is automatically set to zero. 
Furthermore, we have the protein IPTM, which is different from the regular IPTM because uh, you know we have some nucleotides as well, and they have their own PTM scores, so they're not included in the protein IPTM calculations. Complex PD and complex IPD, we'll talk about a little bit more. And then we also have the per chain PTM. So this is the PTM scores for each individual chain because we have four different chains over here. We have the two protein and the two nucleotide chains. We can see that they have different um, PTM scores associated with each one. Next up, we have the PLDDT chart. So this tells us the overall PLDDT for every single one of the positions that can have a PLDDT calculated for it. So we can see that residues um, over here, for instance, residues between roughly 219 to 222 were predicted with a slightly lower PLDT. So maybe this region is less conserved or it might be a little bit more disordered, or perhaps the model itself was just unable to accurately model those positions. And you know, for instance, you know, this range over here is, uh, was uh, modeled very consistently across different models and is modeled with a very high PLDT. So this would be a great, um, you know, it'd be, it would be a great sign in terms of like in interpreting these different regions. Additionally, we'll also be discussing the uh, per chain pair IPTM values. So these are the interface PTM values, but for every single, um, you know, protein, uh, sorry, chain chain um, combination. So because we have the four different chains, we see it's a matrix with four different um, you know, uh, rows and columns. And from what we can see, we can see that the um, chains with A and, sorry, the chains A and D were predicted to have uh, an IPTM value relative to one another of 0, um, 0.91, which is a very, very high value. Uh, on the other hand, we can see that D and B, they had a relatively lower value of 0 0.59, which is actually still fairly high. So, uh, you know, it's just a little bit lower relative to the other ones, but it's still pretty decent. Additionally, we can see that model five, which seems to be less accurate based off all the metrics we've seen overall, um, it actually is less confident in interactions between say D and B as well as D and A. So we can see that the structure from model five is certainly varies a lot more compared to all the other structures that we've seen so far. Next up, we have the PAE matrix. So this is exactly the same as AlphaFold 2, where it's essentially just a metric that tells us um, AlphaFold's confidence in a residue-residue interaction. The main way you want to interpret this chart is that higher values indicate, uh, indicate greater um, positional distance between uh, you know, any residue pair within the structure. So for instance, we can see over here, we have this little box. It would mean because everything is colored much closer to zero with, much, uh, with a much lower uh, PAE, we'd say that AlphaFold is generally more confident in these residues within these squares actually all interacting with one another. However, for instance, if we look over here within the more yellow region, we can see that positions, uh, you know, 1002 and um, 828, they're far less likely to be interacting with one another because AlphaFold predicts a very high um, PAE value at those positions. Additionally, if you want more information on PAE, I would definitely suggest checking out our AlphaFold 2 videos as we go into them in a little bit more depth. Lastly, we have the PAE, um, the PAE matrices. So these are a little bit more different and they essentially tell you regions that are more uncertain overall. For more information on this uh, particular visualization, this particular metric, I would definitely recommend checking out our blog, particularly this Interpreting Bolts 1 Metrics and Visualizations on Neurosnap post. It's really, really great and it's gonna be covering all the different metrics we covered as well as some uh, other information that we didn't cover in this video. So you can, you can definitely check it out and um, see if uh, it answers your questions. Moreover, we have some other really great blog posts, so I'd highly recommend checking those as well. And if you have any questions or um, other areas that you'd want to see covered, you're more than welcome to leave it in the comments, and we'll try our best to get back to it whenever possible. So hopefully you all like this video. Take care and have a great rest of your day.